uh, and uh, uh, Claudi, or is it Mulani or Munshi? <laughs> uh, Adil, Adil, Kirat. Adil comes from a family of Fawaki students. Uh, he's the third in, in a gender and gender. And then uh, Sidi Ibrahim Shahudi, he's a dear uh, teacher of ours here. And then uh, obviously Sheikh uh, Walid Mossad, who's visiting us from New Jersey uh, for the weekend. Uh, so he just arrived, he gave the khutbah at Adams, which some of you were there. And uh, we're very Excited. We wanted the theme to be on Isra' al Mi'raj. Um, that's the prophetic ascent. Uh, given that this 10 day intensive uh, that many of you are in is focused on the prayer, uh, the epitome and, the, and the, the, the peak of the, pro the prophetic spiritual journey was the Isra' al Mi'raj. So we wanted to celebrate uh, that. There will be some chronic ayat regarding that. There will be some nasheed about the Prophet. And then Sheikh Walid um, will, will give the keynote address on on that journey and what it means and some of the, the, the spiritual dimensions and realities we can imbibe from that experience, inshallah. So thank you for joining us and we'll get uh, started with some nasheed. Uh, Sheikh Abdul Karim needs to be first, so we're uh, doing that first. He'll recite some Quran and then we'll get started and then we'll take a break for uh, Isha prayer uh, later on in, for who has, who ha whoever hasn't prayed, inshallah. Okay. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا محمد رسول الله والذين معه أشداء مثلهم في التوراة ومثلهم في الإنجيل كزرع أخرج شطأه فآزره فآزره فاستغلظ فاستوى على يعجب الزراع ليغيظ بهم الكفار وعد الله الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات منهم مغفرة وعد الله الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات منهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما صدق الله العظيم 
ولنا الأنوار لاحات بالحبيب مولاي محمد صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أعبقت مسكان وعنبر واكتسد ذران وجوهر أعبقت مسكان وعنبر واكتسد ذران وجوهر وازدادت حسنا ومنظر بالحبيب مولاي محمد صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رب واجعل والدينا في نعيم خالدينا واسقهم حوضان معينا واسقهم حوضان معينا بالحبيب مولاي محمد صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم طلع البدر علينا من ثدي جئت بالأمر المطاع جئت شرفت المدينة جئت شرفت المدينة مرحبا يا خير محمد كل من يعشق محمد في امان وسلام طالع البدر علينا من ثنيات الوداع وجب الشكر علينا ما دعا حل في خير البقاء اسبي لي ستر علينا اسبي لي ستر علينا يا رحيما بالمطاع طالع البدر علينا من ثني صلاتي وسلامي لرسول الله ازكى صلاتي وسلامي لرسول الله هذه المدينه الله فيها نبينا الله هذه المدينه الله فيها نبينا الله هذه المدينه الله فيها نبينا الله أحمد محمد يا سيدي نور عيني يا أحمد محمد يا سيدي نور عيني يا الحمد لله والشكر 
لله الحمد لله والشكر لله أزكى صلاتي وسلامي لرسول الله أزكى صلاتي وسلامي لرسول الله القبة الخضراء الله نبراس النظراء الله القبة الخضراء الله نبراس النظراء الله القبة الخضراء الله نبراس النظراء الله فيها أبو الزهراء يا سيدي الهاشمية فيها أبو الزهراء يا سيدي الهاشمية الحمد لله والشكر لله الحمد لله والشكر لله أزكى صلاتي وسلامي لرسول الله أزكى صلاتي وسلامي لرسول الله إن المساجد الله فيها الفوائد الله إن المساجد الله فيها الفوائد الله هم فيها عابد يا سيدي مع صدق النية هم فيها عابد يا سيدي مع صدق النية الحمد لله والشكر لله الحمد لله والشكر لله أزكى صلاتي وسلامي لرسول الله أزكى صلاتي وسلامي لرسول الله النبي صلوا عليه صلوات الله عليه النبي صلوا عليه صلوات الله عليه وينال البركات كل من صلى عليه وينال البركات كل من صلى عليه النبي حاضرين اعلموا علم اليقين النبي حاضرين اعلموا علم اليقين أن رب العالمين أوجب الصلاة عليه أن رب العالمين أوجب الصلاة عليه النبي صلوا عليه صلوات الله عليه النبي صلوا عليه صلوات الله عليه وينال البركات كل من صلى عليه وينال البركات كل من صلى عليه النبي من حضر النبي خير البشر النبي من حضر النبي خير البشر من دان له القمار والشجر سلم عليه النبي صلوا عليه صلوات الله عليه النبي صلوا عليه صلوات الله عليه وينال البركات كل من صلى عليه وينال البركات كل من صلى صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما حتى تنالوا جنة ونعيما الله يجزي من يصلي مرة عشرا الله يجزي 
من يصلي مرة عشرا ويبقى في النعيم مقيما أدم الصلاة على الحبيب محمد أدم الصلاة على الحبيب محمد فقبولها حتما بغير تردد أعمالنا بين القبول وردنا إلا الصلاة على الحبيب محمد أعمالنا بين القبول وردنا إلا الصلاة على الحبيب محمد يا إمام الرسل يا سندي يا سندي أنت باب الله معتمد ففي الدنيا يا في دنيا يا واخرتي يا رسول الله خذ بيدي يا رسول الله يا حبيب الله أنت لي عون يوم ألقى الله بيت كل بيت أنت ساكنه غير محتاج إلى السرج يا إمام الرسل يا سندي الله الله أنت باب الله معتمد ففي دنيا يا وآخرتي يا رسول الله خذ بيدي يا رسول الله يا حبيب الله دارك الملهوف يا عظيم الجه ومريض أنت عائد قد أتاه الله بالفرج يا إمام الرسل يا سندي الله الله أنت باب
Oh, 
غير البريء نظرا إلي ما أنت إلا كنز العطية ما أنت إلا كنز العطية يا بحر فاضني وتجعدني يا بحر فاضني وتجعدني جود لي بواصلي قبل المنية جود لي بواصلي قبل المنية حشاك تغفل عن لو تبخال حشاك تغفل عن لو تبخال يا خير مرسل ارحم شجيا يا خير مرسل ارحم شجيا أوليك حبي صلاة ربي أهديك حبي صلاة ربي ما دام قلبي بالذكر حيا ما دام قلبي بالذكر حيا خير البريء نظرا إلي خير البريء ما إلي ما أنت إلا كنز العطية ما أنت إلا كنز العطية سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إلك حميد مجيد سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون قل على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين فاتحة جزاك الله خير أيها الشيخ أبو كريم ما شاء الله يزمن في الأرياء لفترة طويلة he uh, is a world-renowned munshid. Actually, he's invited all over the place. It's Zaytuna, Tabi. Um, they invited him to RS. He wasn't able to go. And in Morocco, uh, he would recite for the for the king of Morocco as well. And so he's uh, very well respected in Morocco as well. And he's a qari. Um, he uh, teaches Quran as well uh, as recites very beautifully. So if anyone's interested in you know, Quran lessons, even for beginners, he's and it teaches all, all backgrounds, so uh, you can speak to me about that. Uh, now, Sheikh Walid, uh, we've been w wait, waiting to hear him, mashallah. He's, um, he's been uh, studying for a number of years overseas. He spent um, a number of years in Al Fat, uh, Mahad Al Fat, in, in Damascus. And he was also studying with a number of the ulama in Damascus. And he spent um, a number of years in Abu Dhabi. Uh, working with the Taba Foundation, with Habib Ali Jifri and others. Uh, they're uh, doing a lot of great work um, and uh, teaching. Uh, in a, he, would ha he has a majlis in Dubai, he teaches as well. Uh, and then most recently he was in Cairo, where he's um, studied with some of the ulama there. His family is still currently in Cairo. He's originally has Egyptian background. And so we're very fortunate to now have him based <coughs> in the U.S. And ho we hope this is the beginning of you know, many programs will have learning from him. Uh, in addition to uh, his specialty, which he's doing a PhD in uh, Aqidah, on some topics regarding to Aqidah, and Ibn Dabdir from uh, Egypt, from Exeter University in UK, 
uh, while being based still in the U.S., he is also Maliki, so I've got a special connection to him. We, uh, we attract Maliki the Fulaki, mashallah. So uh, we look forward to hearing from him, and uh, I'll, I'll leave him and we'll, we'll um, you know, Sheikh Abdul Kareem was very generous with his time, but I think he, he may have to leave. He has another commitment, so as long as he can stay, when he needs to leave, we, we uh, appreciate him being here, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik Ala Sayyidina Muhammad Sayyidina Ulana wa Habibina wa Qurrati Ayunina Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi Wa azwajihi wa dhuriyatihi Wa man ihtada bihadihi ila yawmi ddeen Thumma amma ba'd Can everyone in the back hear me or should I raise my voice? Uh, raise it Volume up. Okay. Um, so I've been asked to speak tonight a little bit about uh, the Prophet's ascension and Isra wal Ma'raj. Um, and I think to put it in context, you can't really uh, do that unless you kind of have some idea of what happened before al Isra al Ma'raj. Uh, specifically in the Prophet so I said in his lifetime and then even before that so typically we think of Ma'raj ascension as him rising up to the heavens Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but he's not the first Prophet who was in the heavens um, the first Prophet in the heavens was our father all of us Adam Alayhi Salam and Adam alayhi salam was in the Jannah. And so was our mother, Sayyidah Hawa, or Eve. And they were there for a while in the Jannah. And then if you go by maybe the biblical narrative or the Judeo-Christian narrative, it's much different than ours. Uh, even though the Quran describes, um, you know, in Hubut or Habata, or they descended down to, to earth, and in other narratives, it's called the fall, both physically and perhaps uh, spiritually. In the Muslim narrative, it definitely was not a fall in the spiritual sense. In other words, Adam alayhi salam and his wife, our mother coming down to earth, was not a punishment. Not for them, not for us. So there is no original sin for us. There is no sort of collective guilt that we all feel because they ate from the forbidden tree. And in essence, when the, Allah SWT speaks about Adam alayhi salam in the Quran, and he tells the angels what he's about to do, he said, inni ja'ilun fil ard khalifa. Right? And the khalifa, the steward or the, or the vice regent or the representative, however you want to translate it, that's a, a maqam, a station of honor. Not of dishonor, not of, of, um, of a fall, of someone who's being dishonored. So Adam alayhi salam, Hawa alayhi salam, that was ikram. It was ennoblement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them in the earth and gave them this maqam of being his stewards upon the earth and entrusted the earth to him and her and to all of us, you know, all the human beings or all of their progeny that would follow after that. And so to, you have to see that one of the uh, things that preceded immediately the, the, this vicegerency being given to Adam alayhi salam is that when they ate from the forbidden tree and it was Iblis la'anahullah, Satan who enticed them or tricked them and we hold Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah in our theology and our aqidah that all of the prophets are infallible and sinless and the majority opinion is even before prophethood and definitely after prophethood. And so the Quran describes it in different terms. Fanesi, he forgot or he, there was a moment of lapse, but it was not a purposefully done transgression or disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are several different that we let or interpretations of how that actually went about, which I don't want to get into much detail now. If people have questions, we can, ask, we can answer them later. But the important part is that uh, when he 
went down to the earth. What preceded immediately was a tawbah. فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ So Adam السلام, and Hawa, right? We also don't have the narrative where the woman is enticed the man and then she's the one who made more of the mistake. And none of that. You know, when the Quran talks about it, those of you who are studying Arabic in, in Fawakih, when you have Alif uh, al right? When you have the pronoun that's an Alif, it means two people did it. Right, min minha. They both ate. They didn't even give an order, but the, the pronoun is going back to both of them. So it was a collective thing. Both of them did. And one is not blamed over the other. And as we said, they are both blameless in a sense uh, for that that happened. Allah SWT decreed that to happen, and it was an ennoblement when they went down to, to the earth. And uh, so after the tawbah, after the repentance, he was ennobled. So even though it was a physical descent, it was a spiritual ascent. And I mention this because if we look to the story of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu we see something similar. If you look to the year that preceded the Isra and Ma'raj, commonly referred to as Am al Huzn, the year of sadness. And that was the year when three significant things happened uh, preceding the Isra and Ma'raj. One was the death of his wife Khadija, radiallahu anha. One was the death of his uncle Abu Talib. And one was his visit to Ta'if and what happened there. So three very difficult occurrences happening all within a span of a few months of each other, directly preceding the, uh, the Isra and Ma'raj. And so we see the epitome of humility with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After he left Ta'if and even the smallest of children and vagrants and vagabonds and all sorts of people throwing rocks at him and you know, saying all vile types of things to him, he still had the rahmah, right? He still had this humbleness about him. He didn't seek revenge upon them, right? And he retired to the Hadiqat Addas in Ta'if, which still is there today, right? And, you know, later on he told to some of the people, he said, you know, they're not, uh, they're not reviling me, right? They're reviling Muthammaman, Walisa Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because one of the things they used to say is twist his name. Muhammad in Arabic, as you know, means the oft-praised one, right? From Hamada, which is takfir. So he was the oft-praised one. So they would say, Mudhammam, min them. And them is the opposite of praise. It's to revile. But that's not his name. So what they're reviling is not him, something else. Some image they have, some impression they have of him, but not Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So... When he retired to the, uh, the, uh, the Bustan or the, 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 the fruit uh, uh, field of Adas, this is when he said the very famous dua, which is beautiful in its, in its, its humility and its simplicity. Allahumma ilayka ashku da'fa quwati wa qillat hilati wa hawani ala nas ya arham rahimin أنت رب المستضعفين وأنت ربي إلى من تكلني إلى بعيد يتهجمني أم إلى عدو ملكته أمري إن لم يكن بك علي غضب فلا أبالي غير أن عافيتك هي أوسع لي أعوذ بنور وجهك الذي أشرقت له الظلمات وصلح عليه أمر الدنيا والآخرة أن يحل, ما أن يحل بي غضبك أو أن ينزل بي سخطك لك العتبة حتى ترضى وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوْتَ إِلَّا بِكَ Right? So he doesn't complain to anyone. Allahumma anta, to you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ashku dha'fa quwwati, my weakness and my inability and my uh, people taking me lightly, hawani ala nas. Ya arhamur rahimeen, you are the Lord of the oppressed and the weak. Shall you put my affair in someone far away that will attack me? Or an enemy that you have given my matter up to them? If there is no anger from you towards me, then I don't care. فَلَا أُبَالِي Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's reminding us here, the Prophet sallallahu that He's accepting of his, his difficult situation. He tried many times, not just in Ta'if, 
but he had the year that they came from, people came from all over uh, the Arabian Peninsula to Mecca where they were making the Hajj. Of course, before it became Islamic once again, but it was a time that they all gathered and many of the Quraysh chieftains would go on and say, don't listen to this man, he's a dreamer, he's a magician, he is this, he is that. Stay away from him. And also he would find these type of reviling responses. So here he recognizes this, but he recognizes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately has his affair. And that he's placing all of his affair with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that it's by the countenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the whole universe has been enlightened. So if all that we want is the rida, is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then nothing else really matters. Wala hawla wala quwwata illa bik. Right? And that's the sir. That's the secret. Our ulama, they told us that the secret to sincerity, at tabarri min al hawli wal quwwa. So the secret to having sincerity is to realize that you have no hawl or quwwa, which means potential or active enactment of your own acts. All of it goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you start placing things and saying, I did, I will do, I will plan, I will make, I will gather. I, 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 me, me, me. And then you are investing in your own self, a quwwa, that's not there. Then this leads to takabbur, this leads to istikbar, this leads to arrogance. Right? And it won't not lead to izz. It won't lead to dignity. It won't lead to rafa to Allah raising you. It will lead to Allah debasing you. So only humility can lead to ascension, can lead to you being raised, which sounds almost uh, counterintuitive, right? Because we think, well, you know, if I want to be a dignified raised person, I have to stand up for myself and I have to, you know, stretch my muscles and pump my chest and so forth. But not in this paradigm, not with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bidalil, that afterwards, as he was going home, making his way towards uh, Mecca from Ta'if, that Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and said, if you like, I can ask the angels of the mountain, al-Akhshabaini, to take them and you know, destroy them on top of Quraysh, if you like, if you seek vengeance. And he said, no, don't seek vengeance. He said, I am hopeful that from amongst them will come those who will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it was as he said. Remember, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's Mujib al-Da'wah, Mustajab al-Da'wah. His dua is answered. His hopes are answered. One of them was asked, what is the most hopeful ayah? Arja ayah fil Qur'an. Right, when you read it, you have so much hope, like, oh, Allah can never chastise me. He'll take me into paradise. And one of them said, وَلَا صَوْفَ يَعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى and your Lord will give you and you will be pleased. And this addresses to Muhammad Sallallahu So Allah is seeking to please the Prophet Sallallahu And the Prophet would not be pleased with any one of his ummah spending any amount of time in hellfire. Right? If he had his way, no one would go there. None of us, none of his ummah would go there. So they said, هذه أرجى آية. This is the most hopeful آية, the most hopeful verse that there is in the Qur'an. So, Ta'if, uh, Isra al-Ma'raj, according to the chronicle, Chronicles, most likely happened about a year, somewhere on a year before the Hijrah. And there's two narrations of where he was when it began. One that he was in his house, and the, the more popular one, that he was in the Kaaba, in the Haram. And if those of you have been there, you'll see that there's something called the Hatim or Hijr Ismail, which is the semi-circular area that's um, directly opposite the black stone on the other side. And it's, uh, that area actually, the Kaaba used to be, its original Qawad was rectangular, not cubical, as it is now. So it was more elongated than it was uh, in its cubical form. That's why we, when we make tawaf, we go around the hijr. We don't, we don't cross in between. If you do that, your tawaf doesn't count because the original Kaaba actually includes all of that. But that area was an area that sometimes they would sit and reside or even lay down. And so 
uh, one evening the Prophet ﷺ was actually laying down there and the riway says, Bayna rajulain, between two men. But those two men were Sayyidina Hamza with Sayyidina Jafar ibn Abi Talib. So one was his uh, cousin and one was his uncle that he was there. The other narration, as I said, uh, also included was that he was in his house uh, and that the angels came to him then. And the angels that came to him were three. Jibreel, Mikael, and they said a third, which they generally acknowledge as Israfil. And Israfil will be the one who blows in the trumpet um, on the Day of Judgment. So those three came to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and one of the first things that they did is what's called Shaq al-Sadr. And this had been done before to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they uh, opened his chest and removed his heart and then washed it three times in a vessel uh, with Zamzam water. So most of the ulama say it happened three times before that. The first time being when he was a very young boy, when he was in the uh, Bani Sa'da and the Halima Sa'diya. Halima Sa'diya was his nursing uh, mother, as was the practice of the Arabs at the time, the, the city Arabs at least, those who lived in Mecca, they liked to send their children for the first two nursing years to somewhere out in the Badia, somewhere out in the countryside, thinking that it's, it's sort of a pure, cleaner environment. And uh, the story of Halima is a, a whole other story into itself. But he had been there for a while, and this is when the two angels came to him, and as a young boy, they had, they had done Shafq al The other time, they say, when he was 10 years old, another time when he actually reached uh, initial stages of manhood. There's some difference of opinion about <laughs> about that and how many it was, but this time during the Isra and Ma'raj. And the way we look at this, or I look at it at least, is the Prophet ﷺ had to be prepared for what was to come. Because we're gonna, what we're going to understand later is there is a point when he's in the Ma'raj, Jibreel leaves him, the Archangel Gabriel, and he says, I can't go with you where you're going. If I were to go with you where you're going, I would be completely burned. I would dissolve. So the Prophet ﷺ he went to a place not even the angels could go to. Not even the angels, not even the highest forms of creation, something that he was sent to. So he was prepared, and he was prepared in this way that his heart was washed three times. The first time, they said, was washed with the water of Rahmah, and then the water of Hikmah, and then the water of uh, Asrar or Ilm. So with mercy and with wisdom and with secrets, his heart was washed. And then he was in a prepared state for what was to come after that in the, in the Ma'raj. So after they had done that, it's also mentioned that the Khat min Nubuwa, the seal of prophethood, or the seal of prophecy was placed on his, uh, behind his left shoulder, or behind his right shoulder, or what would be directly behind his heart. So the left side, so the left shoulder, directly behind his heart. And it said that he was either born with it, or that it was actually placed at this time. And it's about, they say, a quail size egg, you know, like a hamama, or you know, very small, about that big, that was behind his shoulder. And this was the seal of prophethood. So the seal is also symbolic. Right, because now you can think of a seal also as a seal of guardianship, a seal of protection. All of this in preparation for the Prophet Sallallahu for his, for his Ma'raj. And then brought before him was the Buraq, which was the winged horse-like animal that had two wings on either side uh, from the back legs. And the Buraq is not an animal of this, of earth. It's of another realm completely. And of course, al qudra ilahiya saliha. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can, can do as He pleases. Had He wished, He could have sent Him in an instant to Bayt al Maqdis, to Jerusalem, or on the back of anything. But it was the back of this Buraq. Some say He was the first to ride al Buraq. Others say other prophets rode before Him, such as Ibrahim, alayhi salam. You know, different narrations. But the important part is that the Buraq was the winged animal brought before Him, which He rode to. Bayt al Maqdis. And um, just as a side note, some of them mentioned that there are nine other uh, animals in our tradition. Generally speaking, the theology in our tradition is that all animals 
they don't have an afterlife. They kind of serve their purpose in this life and then they become dust or dirt. But there are nine others mentioned who actually go on to paradise. And they're mentioned in the Quran. For which we said the Buraq, the camel, the naqa of Salih, right, which was a, the object of a miracle. The donkey of Al Aziz, the one that came back to life, Surah Al Baqarah. The ajl of Al Khalil of Ibrahim, the, the, uh, the ajl or the, the, the young cow that he prepared for the angels as his guests. Kapsh Ismail, so the, the ram that was going to be slaughtered instead of Ismail or Ishaq. Uh, the hudhud, bird, and the ant of Sulaiman, right? Surah Sulaiman. Um, the dog of Ahl al Kahf, Ashab al Kahf, right? Where he was the eighth outside. The whale of Yunus, Ibn Matta. And the cow of Bani Israel, the one that they were supposed to slaughter. And they picked the golden cow, the golden calf, the best that they had. So those 10 altogether, they said, will be amongst the uh, animals of paradise, in addition to any other animals that obviously are originally of uh, paradise. So we got on the back of the Burak, and then they made their way. And they came to this area where they saw some palm trees. And there weren't so many palm trees in Mecca. Mecca didn't have palm trees and dates and things like that. They made their living by trade. And so Jibreel told the Burak, come down here. And he asked the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu come down to this place and pray. And then he prayed and then he left. Then once again, when they were on their way, he asked the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you know where you went and where you prayed? And Jibreel said, you prayed in the place of Al-Muhajara. You, you prayed in Taiba or in Taba which is the name of Al-Madinah, ala sahiba abdul salatu wassalam. So the first prayer that he was doing on his way was the one in, in Al-Madinah. And he said it's Al-Muhajara. Yeah, in other words, the place of your coming immigration, where you will immigrate to, will be Al-Madinah. So they kept heading north. Medina is north of Mecca. So they went on their way. And then there was another area. And the Burak went down again. And Muhammad Wasallam was asked to pray in this place. And he prayed in this place. And then the same question, do you know where you prayed? He said, tell me. He said, you prayed in, uh, by the tree of Madian. The Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, right? This is where he, after he uh, went to the well and he helped the two daughters of, uh, of Sayyidina Shu'aib, when he married one of them later on, then he leaned against the tree and this is where he said, Right? And he made that dua. That which you have sent of good for me, I am in need. Complete need. So this was a Mubarak place, the place of Median. And then he went on his way. And again, the Burak went down for the third time. And then the same question. Do you know where you prayed, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And he said, this is Tur Sayna. This is where... Allah SWT spoke to Musa alayhi salam, also somewhere in the Aradi Sham, somewhere in greater Syria. And that was the third. Then it went down for a fourth time and came back up after the Prophet SAW had prayed. And he was asked the same question, do you know where you prayed? And he was told, you have prayed in Beit Laham, Bethlehem, the birthplace of Isa alayhi salam, of Jesus alayhi salam. And then finally, to Bayt al-Maqdis, to Jerusalem, to Al-Quds. So how many prayers did he pray? Five. The same exact number of prayers that were going to be made obligatory on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Ummah, those five prayers. So the blessing of praying in those five places, they're Mubarak places, a place where Allah Subhanahu Wa spoke to one of his prophets, where one of them was born from an immac immaculate conception, the place where um, the blessings came to Musa when he made that dua. And of course, Bayt al-Maqdis, one of the greatest places on earth. So after they arrive to Bayt al-Maqdis, the Prophet Sallallahu prayed two rak'ahs in the masjid. And then he was joined by over 124,000 prophets and messengers in that area. And this is where he led them in prayer. So all of the prophets and messengers that ever lived, 
he led them in prayer. That whole saha, that whole area that was there was completely filled with Anbiya and Rasul. And the one who led them in the prayer was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you read some of the, many of our uh, ulama wrote about their travels to Jerusalem. You can read about it, Ibn al-Arabi talks about it, in Abulsi, Ibn Jubair. Uh, Al-Ghazali also spent significant time in Jerusalem. And they said it has a sort of anwar, a light to it, a spirituality to it, you don't find anywhere else. Different than Mecca and Medina. Different than Mecca and Medina. Something quite distinct about Bayt al-Maqdis of Abu quds And inshallah, we all have the opportunity to visit it um, in the best state. In the best state that we can visit it, inshallah. So after he led them in prayer, he was shown some mashahid. He was shown some things of the next life. The riwayat are not clear about whether he was actually shown these in heaven or in hellfire, but he was shown these things of the next life. One of the things that he picked up on was the smell. And he said to Jibreel alayhi salam, ma hadhi al-raha tayyiba? What is this most beautiful smell? This uh, yeah, aroma that's beautiful that I'm, I'm smelling like misk. And he said, this is the smell of the mashita of Fir'aun. This is the smell of, you know, kings and palaces, people didn't use to comb their own hair. They had people who did that for them. So she was the one who used to comb the hair and, and tend to the needs, sort of the handmaiden of the women of the house of Fir'aun. And she was the handmaiden of one of the daughters of Fir'aun. And so one day she was combing the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun and something fell and she said something like, SubhanAllah, or, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And then the daughter asked her, do you believe in a God besides my father? Because what did Fir'aun say? Anna rabbukum al a'la. That's what he said. So when she said that, the, the mashita, she said back to her, yes, I do. She said, should I tell my father of what you say? She said, go ahead and tell your father of what I say. So then Fir'aun came in his jabarut and his takabbur. And he said, do you say that there's another Lord besides me? And she said, yes, I do say there's another Lord besides me. Then he got her husband and her children, two children. She had one who was an infant and one who was a little bit older. And he brought all before them and they all said, we, we see this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is your Lord and our Lord. Your Lord and my Lord. So he prepared this huge brass or copper, you know, like a big huge kettle that you can fit human beings into and fill it with boiling oil. This was how Fir'aun chastised people. He would throw them in this thing. He did the same thing to the Sahara. The magicians who had that mubaraza with Musa alayhi salam that day, and then they said, we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also cast them into this. So he did the same with these people. First the husband, then the other child, and then it was the mother and the infant's turn. And then the infant spoke. And he said to her, لا تقاسي يا أمّا. Don't worry, go ahead. لنكي أنت على الحق. You are on truth and they are on falsehood. And they mentioned that this was one of the infants, one of the few infants in history actually spoke as an infant. The other one that we all know quite well being Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam also spoke as an infant. And the first words he uttered were, Inni Abdullah, I am the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this mihna, this test, was a smell that even hundreds if not thousands of years later the Prophet ﷺ was able to pick up on it in this mashhad as he was making his way towards the heavens. And so at that point the Prophet ﷺ began his mi'raj. And mi'raj just means ascending. And um, most of the ulama say that the mi'raj was not done on the back of the burak. The burak was tied, what they call the wailing wall right now, but what we call the, the, the place where the burak was tied. So he was tied in that area and he didn't take him up. What he was taken up with was ma'arij. So not just one mi'raj, but several ascendancies. And they were more, you can think of it as a type of staircase. And there were 10 of them. So the first seven corresponded to the Saba Samawat, the first seven, where he met those prophets we'll mention in a second. And then there were three more. The eighth being Sidratul Muntaha, the farthest low tree. The ninth being 
where the Prophet Sallallahu heard the writing of the pen, which was al al-Mahfuz, the writing of the, the sacred tablet. And then the tenth and the highest, Al-Arsh, the throne of Ar-Rahman. So he made his ascendancy on this Mi'raj, this Ma'arij. So he comes to the first Sama' and there Jibreel, before reaching the first Sama', he asks for permission to enter. And then the angel who is in charge of those who enter lets them in. Then they arrive at the first heaven and again he has permission to enter and then the man who was there said, who is with you? To Jibreel. So an indication, this is not Jibreel's first time coming here. But the person who's with him, who they sensed, wasn't here before. And said, this is Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he said, has he been sent as a messenger? Has he already been sent as a messenger? And he said, yes, he has been sent as a messenger. Then he said, Ahlan bi ibnin. Ah, you know, Ahlan, or welcome to my son. And this was Adam, alayhi salam, in the first heaven, in the lowest heaven. And we are all collectively the sons and daughters of Adam, alayhi salam. And so he welcomed him, and he said, remember he asked him, has you already been sent? Right, because one of the beautiful things about Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi salam, is all of the prophets knew about him, and they all, part of their theology that they came with is that I am your prophet, but the final and last prophet coming after me will be Muhammad Wasallam. And each single one of them told their people this. Every single one. From Adam all the way to Isa salam, All of the prophets that came beforehand. So then they ascended to the second heaven. And then again, they asked for permission to enter. And then they were asked, who is that with you? And they said, Muhammad Wasallam. But here he found two prophets. Here he found Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam السلام, and Sayyidina Yahya ibn Zakariya. So John and Jesus. And according to the Islamic tradition, they're cousins, either cousins or uncle and nephew. Because the mother of, uh, of Jesus, Maryam bint Imran, was the sister of the wife of Zakariya. And Zakariya was the one who had the kafala, who took charge of Maryam in her infancy because the, the, the mother of Maryam had pledged her what she thought would be a son but turned out to be a daughter to service of uh, the, the temple in worship. And so he was the caretaker of Maryam when she was in that, in that monastery. Anyway, so they were cousins and they said welcome to a fellow brother and they gave him the, uh, the welcoming and then he went on to the third heaven. And in the third heaven, the same question was asked. And here he met Sayyidina Yusuf, alayhi salam, Joseph, alayhi salam. And then the fourth heaven, where he went and there he met Sayyidina Idris, alayhi salam. And then the fifth, where he met Harun, alayhi salam. And then the sixth, where he met Sayyidina Musa, alayhi salam. And then the seventh, the last uh, heaven, where he met his father and uh, fellow prophet Ibrahim, Abraham, alayhi salam. And then he was taken to Sidratul Muntaha, the low tree, the farthest low tree, which is at the, the beginning, the base of paradise. And then he saw, as we mentioned, some of the mashahid, some of the things that one sees in paradise, and some of the things that one sees in hellfire. And then at that point, Jibreel said, I can go no farther than this. I cannot pass this point. So the Prophet Sallallahu ascended by himself, where he heard in the ninth Mi'raj, the ninth ascendancy, where he heard the pens of the of the of the Loh al Mahfuz, as they are recording, either recording the deeds of people as they're being done, or sort of recording in time of all that was to be and that ever was. Two different interpretations of Allah Alam, which is the closest one. And then finally he ascended to Al Arsh, to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where most of the ulama hold that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in the same manner that he spoke to Musa, to Moses, in Tur Sayna, in Sina, he also spoke to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala something along the lines, you have given Musa the Torah, and you have taught Jesus the Torah, and you have 
alanta al hadid li dawood and you gave him the you know the knowledge of how to uh, be a steel smith and, and build armor and swords and shields and so forth and you have made musa kalim allah musa the one that is spoken to and you have made ibrahim khalil allah the one that is the close friend and confidant of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he went on and he said you have given these many things so in essence he was asking what have you left for the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and allah responded back ja'altuka habibi you, I have made you the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have given your ummah khayra ummatin ukhrij linnas. That you are the best ummah that will ever be. And I have given you as sab al-mathani wal Quran al-azim. And I have given you uh, the masajid tuhura. That the whole earth is a masjid. And I have given you uh, the last ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah. And I have given you and I have given you. And he went on and on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all the things that have been given to this Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then at the end he said, وَفَرَطْتُ عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِكَ خَمْسِينَ صَلَىٰ And I have made upon your Ummah 50 prayers, 50 daily prayers. And this is where the, the, uh, the five prayers, they started as 50, were, uh, were made obligatory on this Ummah. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ascended to Ibrahim, back to Ibrahim in the seventh, and Sayyidina Ibrahim stayed silent. He didn't say anything about the 50 prayers. Then he went to Musa, alayhi salam. And Musa had long, arduous uh, experience with people who were not listening to him. He said, 50 is too much. Go back to your Lord and tell him to soften it, you know, to lessen it. So he went back and then it became 45. And he said, no, no, wait, 45 is still too much. So this went on back and forth until it became five. So the Prophet ﷺ came back to Musa ﷺ and said, there are five now. He said, no, no, that's still too much. You should go back. He said, this is what I have been pleased with for my ummah. And so Allah SWT decreed not just five prayers, but five prayers like 50. So each deed that is done counts as 10 deeds. So if you make intention for something and you actually go through with it, it counts as 10. If you make intention for something and you don't go through with it, it still counts for you. These are all khasais, these are all blessings from that blessed mi'raj that we were able to, Allah SWT was to give us through our Prophet Muhammad SAW. Then the Prophet Muhammad SAW ascended back down and then he rode on the Burak back to Mecca. And the next day, he was in a state of a little bit of bewilderment. He wasn't sure what to tell the people. Who would believe him that he went to Bayt al-Maqdis and came back and saw all the things that he saw and so forth. So actually he didn't meet any of the Muslims first. First came to him Abu Lahab. Right? And Abu Lahab said, something seems up with you. What's, you know, what's going on? What's the story? So the Prophet ﷺ said, I actually went to Bayt al-Maqdis. I went to Jerusalem last night and I came back. And I saw this and this and this and so forth. And so Abu Lahab said, oh, that's very interesting. Would you like to come and tell all the rest of Quraysh about your story? And Abu Lahab wanted, he thought this would be the end of Al-Ummah. Something so outlandish to him, how could anyone believe it? So he went before the Quraysh, and he said, yes, I went to Bayt al-Maqdis and came back and so forth. And one, two, three, four, five happened. And one of them, you know, he said, oh, you know, what you actually said all these years before was very easy to digest. But now I think this is khalas, this will be the end. Who is going to believe you? It takes us a month to go and a month to come back from Bayt al-Maqdis, how can you have done it in one night, and so forth. And then Abu Bakr appeared, radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr, it was said to him, your friend, he said he goes to Bayt al-Maqdis and he comes back. Can you believe such a thing? He said, if he said it, I believe it. He said, why wouldn't I? I believe him with something even greater than this, al-khabar min al-sama. I believe him from what he tells me comes from the heavens. Why would not I believe that? And from then on, then on he was known as Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. The one who believes. The one who believes strongly or much. So he's been known as a Siddiq since then. But it was a fitna, it was a trial for many Muslims. Many Muslims actually left Islam that night or that day because of what they could not comprehend, what could not understand. And that was only Bayt al-Maqdis. He didn't even mention the Ma'raj. He's only talking about Jerusalem and back. He didn't mention, the Uraid doesn't mention that he talked about what he saw in the heavens and so forth. But nevertheless, this was something that 
Allah SWT gave to him, right? مَا زَاغَ الْبَصُرُ وَمَا تَغَى لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَةِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى Right? He was not mistaken, he was not bewildered. He had seen from the greatest signs of his Lord. مِنْ آيَةِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى The most awesome, the greatest signs of his Lord. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this great ikram, right, the, this ennobling of the Prophet ﷺ is not just for him, but it's an ennobling of the ummah. The ennobling of the whole ummah. Because no other Prophet was given something similar to what the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. All of the miracles that the other Prophets had know that the Prophet Wasallam had something like it, similar, or even greater than it. So Musa Wasallam spoke and to Allah and back, so did Muhammad Wasallam. Sidna Yusuf was given Shartul Hust. He was given, they say, half of beauty. Prophet Wasallam was given a Shatrain, all of beauty. He was more handsome, he was more noble, he was more beautiful than Yusuf Wasallam. The only reason that it's not mentioned this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put a sort of hijab because if people were to see the Prophet ﷺ in his haqiqah, in his reality, they would not be able to, to fathom it. They would not be able to encompass it. It would be too much. It would be overwhelming. But for Sayyidina Yusuf, he lifted that. For the Prophet ﷺ, in fact, the Sahaba mentioned we couldn't look at him directly. Some of them mentioned when we were standing far away and he's walking, we couldn't tell the difference between him and the horizon because it was all light. We couldn't make him out from far away, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he was walking, no one, even if people were taller than him, they couldn't tell that because he appeared taller than everyone else, even though he wasn't. These were all things that, that were specific to the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so when we talk about lessons for us, you know, how do we, how do we understand this and how do we, you know, make some of these uh, lessons work in our own life, I think it's important what we referred to in the beginning, that we are uh, a nation, an ummah, a community of love and humility. And they go hand in hand. When the Prophet ﷺ mentioned all the other things given to the other Prophets, and he was made the beloved, al Habib. ﷺ. And so, via love, via humility, right, via uh, humbleness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you become a raised nation. Why is it the best community? Why is that? Not because Allah chose us to be. We don't make claims. We don't say we're the chosen people. Just because Allah chose us, khalas, we have become the chosen people. It's mashroot. It's conditional. تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَلَى الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ If you don't do those, those three, then you're not خير ummah. You're not the best community. Right? You uphold truth and you forbid wrongdoing and evil and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the conditions to be the best ummah, the best community. So we're not an ummah, a community that rests on its laurels and say Allah has chosen us and we are the chosen people and everyone else is kind of secondary to us. Rather, we are the ummah of love and humility. Be humble before others, Muslim or non-Muslim. Show them love, show them respect, show them kindness, show them compassion, show them caring, and amazing things will happen. Amazing things happen to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Amazing thing happens, happened to the Sahaba, to all of the companions, because of that moral lesson that they learned from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Despite the adversity, you know, if you, if you really imbibe these, uh, I don't want to call them stories because we think story like a myth, like a, some type of fable, but they're not. They're reality. It's what we describe here, it's a reality. It's not some fable that happened like, you know, some mythical place. It actually happened more or less as the way as we describe according to the riwayat. And the idea that it's been preserved for us even 1400 years later is so we can draw lessons from it. Men and women traveled vast expanses of desert and spent sleepless nights just to get these riwayat, these narrations that people like us sitting very comfortably, you know, in a heated place and we can all just read it in one compact place to, uh, to benefit from. But much work was behind it. Much sacrifice was behind it. So nothing that's really worthwhile, nothing that we really want to um, go after is going to be worth it unless we put some sacrifice, we put some time. So um, I'm very pleased that the people here in Fawakih, they're all learning Arabic. Um, you've chosen the hard way in some sense. Yeah, and it's kind of the easier thing to just you know, read all the books that we want in English 
uh, about uh, the Islamic tradition or fiqh or theology and so forth. But when you read it via the language it was revealed in, it's a completely different scenario. Complete, and those of you who have even studied a little bit, maybe a few months, you're starting to pick up on that. And remember, language, it's, um, it's a type of formal means to gain access to thought, to ideas. And if the thought and ideas of the most blessed thoughts and ideas are in a particular language, namely Arabic, then why would I not spend time and sacrifice learning that language? for me to have access to that. Because remember, there's no really translation of language to language. Most linguists acknowledge this. The most that you can get is one person's particular interpretation of um, the meanings of a particular language and putting them in another language. So it's giving you a shade of the meaning. A translation will always be a shade of meaning. It's not a translation. It can't be. It's not possible. It's giving you some shade according to the translator who's interpreting it on your behalf, which may be prone to error, may not. But as you know, the Arabic language is such a language of many meanings, of many, as one linguist put it, significances. So there could be primary meanings, but there are shades of meaning you can only pick up if you have access to, to the language itself. So I encourage all of you to continue with um, your study of the language. Uh, you will find that not only will it open doors for you in understanding the Qur'an, but I think it will open doors for you in understanding yourself and reality. Right? It's not a mistake, it's an Arabic language. Um, the Arabic language still has secrets that have not been penetrated. And you can spend a whole lifetime studying it and still those secrets you know, can, be, can become more accessible to you as, you as you go along. So I thank you all for uh, listening. I hope I didn't take too long. Jazakumullah khair. I hope there was some benefit in it. And hopefully tomorrow uh, we'll have some sessions, I think reading from uh, Ghazali's Ahya on Bab al-Athkar wa da'wat, insha'Allah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. taking us on that beautiful story and journey of the Prophet We wanted to, we had a few minutes. If anybody wanted to entertain some questions or... It's up to you. Could entertain it, maybe a, a few questions if anybody has some, and then we can. If anyone needs to take wudu, and uh, we will be praying to as we conclude for those uh, for Isha. So if anyone needs to make wudu, they can, you know, quietly go out. The the bathrooms are on the, uh, on, are on the end of the hallway for the men, and on the left, right outside the door, the first set of doors uh, for the women. So you can do that. Uh, but we can entertain a few questions, and then if you have any announcements. Um, Uh, um, one question I was thinking of uh, when Shaitan refused to make uh, to Allah said, Malika and Takabarafiya Takuj, saying Allah Ta'ala already cursed Shaitan from that moment. So, how do we have access to go into Jannah later on to, you know? convince them to have the fruit of the tree. That always perplexed me. Mm. Um, one thing about uh, that period of time, as it were, is we can't think of it as having sort of the same rules and sharia and all the things that we do expect now. And uh, as we mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, enabled Adam and ennobled him by going down to, to the paradise. And so the idea of shaitan influencing him even in heaven, even after he did that. It's one of the asrar, one of the secrets um, that I don't have, a, I don't have a, a, you know, an answer that I can give you. But all I can say is not all, all of those things that happened in that time, even before there was nubuwa, even before there was prophethood, are going to submit to like, our understanding of uh, jaza and you know, reward and punishment and, and so forth. Uh, Allah Adam. Yani, there are some minority opinions that say that the Jannah of Adam is a different Jannah than the Jannah of Paradise. So it was kind of a type of Jannah, but not the Jannah. That's one opinion. Others say, no, it was exactly Jannah to Adn is Jannah, the same Jannah. But Allah SWT allowed, um, even after this shaitan, to have some influence uh, in that Jannah.
Allah Ta'ala subhanahu wa ta'ala ala wa ala. Yes. So you mentioned the uh, hand moments in Moving. Mm-hmm. I get asked this question a lot, you know, people how they love their hands from this world. It's like it's a lot. What was the purpose for animals? Why were they created? And you guys were created to obey and worship Allah all the time and they will become dust. Then why were they created? What was the purpose? They cr- they are created for us. Yeah, and for example, um, والخيل والبغار والحمير اللي تركبوها وزينة ويخلق ما لا تعلمون. Right, so he created uh, birds of uh, animals of of burden that you ride, like horses and mules and donkeys. لتركبوها so that you can ride on them وزينة and also as a type of adornment in this life. ويخلق ما لا تعلمون and he creates that which you do not know. In other words, other modes of transportation that you don't even know about yet. Some of them mentioned this is like an indication of the modern plane and train and cars and things of this sort. So our, our idea of stewardship on this earth is that everything on this earth for the human being, for man, is at his disposal, but as a trust. Not for him to manipulate and not to usurp uh, and not to manipulate in, in a manner that does not preserve it for future generations. So that means the animals that are on this earth, the trees, the rivers, the mountains, all of the natural resources, they're all there for one of the purposes of life is for us to cultivate life on this earth. To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, a, is one of the primary reasons we're here and also to cultivate this earth. But cultivate it in a manner that's commensurate with the prophetic ideal where it's stewardship and not manipulation. You know, not taking things and manipulating them and putting them to our use merely for our use but rather in a sustained way. You know, nowadays they call these things sustainable development, and we had that long time ago, the idea that even, even the word development is problematic in the sense that you're kind of taking these raw materials and making something out of it, but at the same time, you manipulate it in such a manner that it's no longer preserved for future generations, which is it was antithetical to Islam. So even all of the animals that are here, like the cows and the sheep and so forth, um, they're there for us to eat, they're there for us to sustain ourselves, so are the animals that we ride upon and that are used for work, but also in, in a manner that doesn't abuse the animals, that doesn't cause harm to them. And they're there for our use uh, in this life. And they're there as a trust, as an amana. So um, there's some debate. Generally speaking, the Muslim theologians, they say animals don't really have souls in the sense that, um, like we do, like they kind of have mudrika, uh, that they have souls that can perceive sort of ethical and moral responses and things like this. And other, some of, there's some minority opinions that say, you know, the, uh, the camel that spoke to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and complained about its owner, that it, it was cursing it and abusing it, you know, that either that was something, a miraculous thing that Allah gave it the ability to speak at that time, or there is some type of something there. And the Quran acknowledges it as much. Right? And when it says everything makes tasbih, everything makes tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ But you don't understand how they're doing it. So the whales in the sea and the birds chirping and so forth, this is all types of hymning of praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in a manner that we may or may not understand. So animals definitely are, are divine creatures in the sense that they are divinely created and they have their hurma, they have their sanctity. And it's not merely there for us to abuse. You know, when I see small kids like, it's not so much in this country, but unfortunately in the Middle East, you know, throwing rocks at cats and things like that and, and abusing animals. And, you know, one time I was in a zoo and they had cigarette butts throwing at the lion. It's just the, yeah, I mean, it shows you a sick society. It shows you that people kind of really don't get it about, you know, that these animals are here as a, as a trust and as an amana, something for us to take care of, not to, uh, not to abuse. So. Say not all dogs go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that the Prophet had with Allah, and that this is our part of that experience. Uh, do you, uh, have you? The tahiyyat, yani. Yes. Well, we give salam to the Prophet directly in tahiyyat. We say, As-salamu alayka, ayyuhu al-nabi, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
and then we give salam to Ibadullah Salihin and, and all of the Prophet Muhammad and Ibrahim alayhim salam, yani Salah al um, But a direct connection to the Mi'raj, I, it's possible, but I haven't really seen anything specific because about that. That the conversation, the Atayat and the way it was done was, some say that it is actually the conversation, the part of it what he had and he repeated, but you have not. Possible, but I'm, I'm not aware of that. Father. One thing fascinates me about Islam, and as you said, there are lots of blessings came with it. One of the blessings came is the prayer that we have actually the opportunity to experience the Mi'raj. Rasulullah Sassim said that the Salah of the Mi'raj is Mu'minin. That Salah no. is the Mi'raj of the Mu'min. No. So from the very Mi'raj came something, an opportunity for us to attend the Mi'raj. It's true. Uh, even though the Prophet said he both, it was both physical and spiritual, but while that sort of physical experience may not be up, uh, available for us, but the, the spiritual one, the Mi'raj and the prayer, it is the experience. The Salah is the most important thing that you have to do. Not because it's an obligation and you're burdened with it, right? And the Quran acknowledges as much, It's a kabir, it's a burden, except to whom? al khashi'in. So those who are benefiting from the prayer, they have khushua, they understand what the prayer is about, it's a munaja. And munaja means conversation, means secret inner conversation that's available 24-7 for the five prayers and outside of the five prayers. Yeah, and it's always there for us. Tomorrow we'll talk more about it, about uh, dhikr and da'wat, but this open channel with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is, like you said, it is the ma'raj. It is a way to ascend some from the sisters. The Ruh al Mahfuz is, is a possible interpretation. The, the riwayah says, Sarif al Aqlam, which is the sound of the, the pen's writing, like, you know, like sort of a whispering um, type of sound. So they said that's a possible interpretation, Ruh al Mahfuz, or the writing of people's deeds as they're being recorded. So um, the riwayah doesn't, to my, in my knowledge, doesn't mention anything more specific uh, about that. Good question. Good question. Um, the order is not clear also because some of the ulama, they said the, I believe the Suti is one of them, he said that the prayer was actually after he came back down. And um, what you mentioned just now is one of the reasons why they think that because he would not have asked about that. Or uh, he could have still led them in prayer first, but uh, you know, it, Allah SWT made them to in a state where they had to ask, they didn't see him, they only sensed him that someone was coming. They did not actually physically see the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they had a sense he was there. And then when they saw him, then they recognized who he was. See, could it be that Abu Ayt al Nabi was, is he summoned to the heavens instead of meaning like the Ja'far? Like She's asking about um, when after he led them in prayer and they know he led them, then he went up. You know, like what happened? When he asked him in the heavens, has he been summoned? Which means, like, has he been summoned to come up to the heavens? Uh, like Mumkin. I don't, I haven't heard that one, but that's, that's possible. Another one that I just, I just remembered now also, they said that when he met them in the heavens, that was sort of um, a, a spiritual manifestation of them, not really them. But when he led them down in prayer, that was them. Allah brought them back. Except for 
Isa alayhi salam because he never died to begin with. So he actually saw him in body and spirit um, in the second heaven. Wallahu alam. And Uqila Sayyidina Idris also in the same category, but that's another story. Here, and then the you said uh, Adam alayhi salam, uh, his fall was not straight, but it was an honor. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. No. In order of the Quran, not necessarily in order of time. But it's like the same story. Doesn't, doesn't, that's not, so it's not necessary. Not so, even fardan, let's say that's true. Yani, do we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like, had high hopes for Adam and then he made a mistake and he didn't know what was going to happen? And, la, so abadan. So maybe... la, abadan. We don't, our Islamic narrative is not, a, it's, not a, it's not a fall. We don't have the idea of a fall. It's the idea of he, this is istikhlaf. He was made a khalifa. And much think of it this way, when um, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he engages the prophets in a way that there's a, a greater lesson or wisdom to be learned from it. I'll give you a smaller example. With the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one time he was uh, leading the prayer and then he had finished. And then some, a man known as Dhul Yadain, the man with the two long arms, because he had long arms. And in the, in the majlis, people who were behind him were included people like Omar, Abu Bakr, and Ali. And then he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Has the prayer been shortened or did you forget? So it was a four raqa prayer, maybe he played three. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, they said, he described what he did and he had his head on his chin like this and looked upset. Uh, and he said, Kullu lam yakun. He said, none of that happened. And he didn't acknowledge initially that there was some sahu in the salah. But the way we understand that sahu, you know, we could, we could think, how can the Prophet Sallallahu forget how many rakas he was doing? How's that, you know, because he's like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? But the way we look at it, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sahu. Lam yansahu, alaykum Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sahu, right? Those of you who take Arabic, what's the difference? He was made to forget, right? So he was made to forget. Otherwise, how would we know how to do sujood al sahu Where would that come? Unless it actually happened to the Prophet ﷺ. How would we know the value of tawbah, of repentance, and that it's actually a constant state for us? Tawbah is not like a one-time deal, you know, uh, when you go to Hajj, you're ma'rafa, ya rab, and then you go home and you're done. La, tawbah is every day. Tawbah is every instant. Every moment, we need to make tawbah. We're always making mistakes. So the, the state hatta of the highest awliya also is partly tawbah, repentance. And so the greatest epitome of tawbah was that of Adam, alayhi salam. We would not know that lesson had it not been for that. And then how the, the manifest blessings that come from tawbah, he, he honored him. It wasn't a disgrace. He was honored by it. I mean, I wasn't saying it was a disgrace. I was just saying, how come that order was so Yeah, no, it's... Uh, I hope I answered your question. Uh, what do we know about why Abu Bakr Sakha was placed in Makkah with his family? Was, was the place, as opposed to Makkah, Medina, or any other city where he was put in their lodge? Also, is there any connection in terms of um, like the temple of Suleiman al Islam and you know, being also in that lodge? Like, do I believe uh, with what he did and what he did not do after Abu Bakr? Well, I'll answer the second half first. Uh, the so-called Temple of Sulaiman, that's actually for us Masjid al-Aqsa. We don't call it that. Yani, the, the plain, the area itself, uh, Bayt al-Maqdis, right, that Allah describes in the Quran, barakna hawlahu, and we place blessings around him, around that place. That Bayt al-Maqdis, regardless of the buildings that are actually there. So it's not the, the edifice that's built there, but the place itself. That's why we call it Bayt al-Maqdis, that sacred place, or that sacrosanct place. And so Sulaiman did build a ma'bad, he built a temple there. And uh, then later on the Umayyads um, built uh, Al-Aqsa and Al-Sakhra, Masjid Al-Sakhra and so forth. But for us, the holiness, the sanctity of that place is the, is the actual area, not the buildings that may be there. So we don't see the temple of Sulaiman as a Jewish temple. We see it as a mosque, it's a masjid for us. 
So the idea of, well, we, you know, as the Jews say that we need to destroy it and put back, bring back the temple of Suleiman, we would say it's already standing there. That's, that's, your, that's supposed to be your temple. That's what superseded it. That's the masjid. You know, that, that's supposed to be there. So Bayt al-Maqdis has, that, uh, you know, has that, that special place for us. And I think the ummah is suffering many ways, but one of the ways it's suffering is when, you know, one of the, the greatest places for us and the most sacred places in the state that it's in, it's going to affect the ummah. There's going to be a sort of uh, collective sort of uh, pain, you know, of sickness. And part of that is the state that Aqsa is in, that it's currently facing. And I think, inshallah, when that, when that burden is lifted, when it's liberated, then uh, things will be different for this ummah, inshallah. So you didn't touch upon the, the dimension of time to the ummah. Uh, how do you think that affects the ummah? Because it's not Right. Well, we need time in this earth, or you know, urgency of our buddhi, uh, our everything is time, and so on and so forth. When we go to the, when he goes to the realm of outside of what we're bound with, time doesn't really matter anymore. How do we understand that in relation to akhirah, or do we know? Can we gather anything from that story in terms of like in akhirah? Because what does time matter anymore, right? After you left left this world. <laughs> Um, it's infinity, basically. Right. Well, that's a very, very good question, very astute question. Um, time is actually all that we have. That's the whole thing. If you understand that the time that you have here on this earth, that's the whole story, and that's what you should be worried about, because it's finite. And finite means it's deficient. And if it's deficient, it means that uh, you shouldn't be spending too much time about things that are not important for something that is infinite, as you mentioned. So some of the ulama, even like the Ghazali, he talks about how if you want to convince someone, even just from a purely intellectual point of view, why would you spend, um, you know, what would considered an instant compared to infinity, wasting it when all you have to do is certain things right, you know, lay down your seeds and then you harvest it for the next life, which is infinite. And you're right. Remember that the next life is perfection. And perfection means that you'll never run out of time. Because that's a deficiency. So it's almost as if the passing of time in this life is a clear indication, a clear evidence and proof and delil that this life is, is really trivial. In a sense that we shouldn't waste our time <coughs> doing things that are not going to prepare us for the next life. And as we said in the khutbah today, it's Dar Mamar or it's Dar Maqab. It's a passing through place, and it's not a place that we set down firm roots and think we're going to be here forever. Because we can pass out any time. Um, so, perhaps in the, in the Na'raj, uh, certain events, in fact, uh, towards you know, the end of days type of period, time will go by very fast. That's actually one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. That time will appear to be moving faster. In reality, maybe time isn't moving faster, but the amount, the way people are using their time, barakah. the barakah of the time is not there. Yeah. Even to the extent where it gets, when the Prophet said it mentions near or close to the end of days, where you know the, uh, the year will be like a month, and the month will be like a day, and the day will be like an hour. Clear indication that the slippage of time away from you is a sign of lack of barakah. Mm -hmm. And the ability to do many things in even a small amount of time is a sign of barakah. I remember previous nations, they had longer lifespans than us. Noah he, his da'wah was 950 years. Not how long he lived, his da'wah, 950. And after all that time, how many people did he get? A handful, 13, 14, that followed him. But yet, one of the blessings of this ummah is that in a short lifespan, with few deeds, relatively speaking, we have all of this that Allah can give us. And even some of the narrations indicate when Nuh was told, alayhi salam, you know, the Ummah of Muhammad is going to live like 60, 70 years only. He's like, that's it. He's like, I would have spent it in sujood. Wow. <coughs> the whole time in sujood. Wow. 
that's all they have. No opportunity to sin. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Walid. It's clear everyone has a lot of questions. Mashallah, um, Sheikh Walid is here with us on Sunday. At, um, to, he'll have a, his last session will be Sunday morning, then he'll be heading to Allentown uh, with the Sakina program there, where he teaches weekly. Um, so those who live near Allentown, make sure to connect with Sister Sumeya so that you can attend those programs. Um, uh, we, we have, uh, if you want to attend for the rest of the weekend, you can register for the weekend program. So it will be uh, uh, tomorrow from 1 to 4. You'll have sessions on, uh, from Ehya al on uh, remembrance, and then we'll be talking about um, uh, remembrance and supplication. Uh, the second session will be tomorrow night from 7 to 9 also here, and then uh, the last session with Sheikh Walid will be Sunday morning uh, from uh, 9 to 10.30 a.m. So if you want to register for that, you can do that on the Fuwake website and just join us tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Um, we also have uh, next month on the 31st of January, we, ha we have a special guest joining us from also New Jersey. Seems like it's a place of uh, uh, becoming a place of Arlema now. <laughs> Seems to be migrating there. Uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman Ahmed, he's also a uh, very special teacher. He, he, she was raised in Pakistan, although he's from an American uh, convert background. His father was a, is a scholar in Pakistan, and he is a Hafiz. He, he's an Imam of an institute um, of a masjid in Trenton, New Jersey, also of an institute. He's an uh, amazing uh, scholar. He'll be with us for the weekend, 31st, 1st, and 2nd. His wife is also an alima, so we're blessed to have her with him, and she'll be doing some sister sessions, so keep an eye out for that as well. And uh, lastly, we just want to end with uh, a, 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 a nasheed uh, from one of our students here at the Winter Intensive, uh, Brother Adil. And then, if anyone needs to make wudu, please do so, we'll pray immediately afterwards. So your year-long program starts with Wednesday? Yes, the, uh, the year-long uh, courses uh, start in January, end of January, inshallah, for anyone interested in uh, joining that. Many of you are in the course. So if anyone else wants to join, you can speak to Brother Ismail. Uh, it's a year-long course here. We have it in other locations as well uh, for people who are looking for a place near their city. Through the night we lay through the day we pray, worshiping Allah every night, every day. Through the rows we stand, hands up in the air, to find a way to Him. Through the days we laugh, understand and tap into in our hearts ease our pain we ask ya allah i pray make my life every day to remember allah every night every day to remember allah Every night, every day in my life I've wronged Understand my thoughts crawl into my heart Hear these words I sought speak into the heart Praise Allah, it's a start only He is the one, none but Him, He's Allah. Only He is the one, none but Him, He's Allah. Through the days we laugh, understand and tap into in our hearts. Ease our pain, we ask, Ya yeah, Allah, I pray, make my life every day to remember Allah every night, every day, to remember Allah every night, every day. Through the night I pray, in my heart is pain, don't know how to say 
but I pray every day to ask you why I am full of shame. Ya Allah, I pray, help and guide me to you. Ya Allah, I pray, help and guide me to you. Through the days we laugh, understand and tap into in our hearts. Ease our pain, we ask, Ya Allah, I pray, make my life every day to remember Allah, every night, every day, to remember Allah, every night, every day. <coughs> Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar I think you just shifted Allah 